Well, hello there, and welcome to another Under the Cowling, where we're going to talk about aircraft. And today, we're continuing our series on the F-117, which is exciting, especially for me, because we get all these wonderful speakers to come in and talk about it. There's a lot of mystery and misconceptions around that airplane, and today I've got Bob Lasky today, and... There goes one of those fine aviation products. I think that's our steerman actually interrupting our video. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit today with Bob. And Bob, now, am I, first of all, welcome. Uh, and I, is it fair to say that you're the, the father, creator of the flight control system, yes. designer? Is that a, a fair statement? I don't want to go too far. No, that's, but That's true. I, I, I happen to get all the credit. And when well, it's good, yeah. you get all the bad stuff. On That's it. Bad. Well, you know, the apex of the hill, you know, everything <laughs> rolls down. And if you're at the apex, yeah. generally you're in charge, you're at the apex of the hill. So today we're, we're with Greg Kenny, who is off camera. Now, Bob, as we always do, if you're peaked, we, we got you a little thing for your blood sugar. So okay. uh, Greg got you a wet nap. If I ask you too many questions, you start sweating. And I guess sealed for our protection, we have a foil-wrapped Pellegrino that Greg has uh, brought out today, which I've never seen a foil-wrapped Pellegrino, and obviously it's some water. So, well, I think, why don't we, I always try to find out motivation. Where, where did you, obviously, you didn't wake up one day and say, I'm just going to design the F-117 flight controls. How did you get started? in aerospace what was your motivation when did your interest start well uh, i was born in 1937 and uh, i was four years old during world war ii and the one day an army uh, at6 came and landed just outside of our town and the i think they were selling war bonds oh and, so everybody in town, you know, nobody had ever seen an airplane up close. So everybody went out and uh, the guys gave their pitch and uh, everybody was signing up for the war bonds or whatever. And then they climbed in the airplane, took off and flew away. And that, that did it for me, you know. So uh, one day I'm going to do something like that too, you know. So that's, wow, that's cool. Started me off. So did you... Um... Uh, I know because like with me, I, you know, knee pants and then just chasing airplanes all the way through school. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, uh, when you went to, you went to university, did you, yeah. is that where, what your focus was? Well, it, my, uh, when I was in high school, I seemed to have a talent for mathematics and science. And uh, my folks would not have been able to send me to school or university, but my uh, high school principal he wrote a letter to the University of Oklahoma and, and recommended that, you know, somehow, you know, they could give me some help. And so they awarded me a, a academic scholarship oh, in, wow. in, in engineering. So I got uh, books and tuition. I still had to work for room and board and everything, but uh, that started me off. And all thanks to Mr. Bingham. <laughs> And uh, so after I, I, I graduated from the University of Oklahoma with two engineering degrees, the first one was aeronautical engineering because I was interested in airplanes. Right. But about halfway there, I was introduced to control system engineering. And because the curriculum, uh, they, they wanted you to not be super specialized in something. So they always required you to have... Uh, you know, cross fertilization, such like so. Right. And the electrical engineering school is where they taught the uh, control system theory. So I started taking those courses, and pretty soon I had so many courses in control system theory. They said, "Well, you might as well go ahead and get your degree." So when I graduated, I had two degrees: one in uh, aeronautical engineering, one in electrical engineering, okay. majoring in control systems. That's interesting. And at that point flight controls we moved away you know you talked about world war ii right where well no this was by the time i graduated that was 1961 and uh, so airplanes were you know the jets were coming along and the a jet like the f4 uh, is a miserable handling thing and it needs help you mm -hmm. need all of them need stability augmentation 
And so there were systems that were being designed in the 50s and 60s to give the airplanes halfway decent handling qualities, you know, when they were flying, uh, doing their missions. And so that was that was a big thing already in the 50s and 60s. So you're talking about like uh, what we would think about in modern aircraft, like an F-16, like a flight control computer, the the box. Yeah, well, it was a little. It was simpler than that. It was basically a damper. You know, you'd have okay. yaw dampers, roll dampers, pitch dampers, and right. so forth. <clears throat> so they were all inherently stable airplanes, but they were, you know, were pretty wobbly if you turned the dampers off. And the pilot probably could not, you know, complete the mission without the dampers. So, but he could fly the airplane, bring it back, and land it. But uh, it was probably not possible to do the mission without the dampers on. Really? Yeah. And so, and you're talking like you can't, our folks can't see it off camera, but we have an F4 and S yeah. sitting over there on the other side here. Uh, so when the airplane is dirty, you know, it's got all its pylons and all the other stuff on it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah, you create a lot of drag and all kinds of other yeah. nasty things to yeah. the airfoil. Yep. And so that's kind of what you're talking about, I think, right? And, and they would carry the stores under the wings. Right. And so if they dropped the store off of one wing and it didn't, they didn't drop the one on the other, now the airplane is really unbalanced. And so it could get itself into trouble. And the F-4 was an example of an airplane that would go they, what they call a yaw departure. They got up too high an angle of attack and just even touch a little bit of lateral stick, the airplane would depart and yaw. Really? Yeah. And so the stability augmentation system were designed to kind of help the pilot. You know, you know some, sometimes they couldn't do anything except warning. You say, like you're getting you're getting close to a, a departure. Don't. It's do like it. a stick shaker or, yeah. or something. Let right. them know. Yep. Uh, stick shaker. We're talking about for folks that aren't into that type of stuff. Um, the depart of the airplane. The common term and bob correct me if i get off in the weeds here but imagine driving a car and you're driving along and you hit black ice yeah and the car just starts sliding and you no matter what input you put to the wheel it's yeah. just going to go wherever it's going to go until it stops right yeah, the pilot would in those circumstances the pilot is just a passenger he doesn't have any control on over anything there's nothing more helpless yes. than that when you realize that you right. are just along for the ride right. until it decides what it wants to do yep. so uh, so you're you're and and the F four is an app example because at that time the generation the one hundred five mm -hmm. all the Century Series fighters yeah uh, McDonnell Douglas product so how did you you got out of college where'd you go after that well I, I had a short stint at Boeing and uh, the Boeing was you know making big airplanes tankers and airliners and such. And I wanted to do something more interesting with, with go fast airplanes, and so I got an offer from Lockheed, and uh, I wanted to get away from the miserable weather up in Seattle, <laughs> and yeah. uh, so came down to Lockheed, and I spent my entire 37 career. At, uh, really? In Lockheed, yeah. That is uh, very few people yeah. can claim that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when you ended up at Lockheed and obviously we have to be careful even now about uh, with, with all the Lockheed guys, there's a, I have to be careful about what question I ask. Cause they right. say, well, I tell you that, but I have to kill you. Uh, you wouldn't do that though. Yeah. But the, uh, what'd you, what'd you start on at Lockheed? Well, I, I didn't have any clearances at the time. And so they put me to work on, in, uh, non-classified stuff. Uh, they were flying the YP-3, the Navy patrol bomber, you know, the uh, that was the prototype airplane. Right. And they were having some problems with the autopilot. And so my first job was to analyze the flight test data, try to figure out what was going wrong, you know, we set up simulations. And then after we were able to, uh, you know, match the flight test results and try to figure out what we had to do to fix the problem. And uh, shortly thereafter, I got my first confidential clearance. And then they, uh, we were finished up with the P3 problem. And shortly afterwards, I got my secret clearance. And then they put me on the F-104. And the F-104 was having also autopilot problems. Now, this was the F-104G. Okay. And uh, the airplane 
Germans uh, wanted to have an all-weather uh, aircraft, tactical aircraft, and uh, one of their requirements was is that the airplane is flying, climbing at Mach 1.6, and he gets to 50,000 feet, and the pilot presses a button, and the airplane is automatically supposed to pitch over and capture 50,000 foot altitude and then hold that altitude. Well, uh, whenever we were doing the flight testing on it, it would hit, come up like this, dive down, back and forth, to just continue this. And so and then they put me to work on trying to figure out what was causing trying that. Trying to smooth it out, yeah, huh? Yeah, And uh, so that was my first job uh, in a, in a go-fast airplane. And uh, the pilots, uh, you know, the, it was an autopilot problem, actually. And, and so the pilots didn't like doing those kind of tests because when it was above 50,000 feet, they had to wear the pressure suit. You had to sit around first and breathe pure oxygen, you know, for an hour mm -hmm. and then get in the airplane and go out and test it. And one day I remember we were <laughs> testing the 104 and the pilot had already done this three times, you know, so he'd done one at like nine o'clock in the morning, one at about noon and another one at about three o'clock. Came back down and, and the... Uh, the guys that were responsible for the autopilot said, oh, we got an idea we can try. And the pilot says, the keys are in it. It's full of gas. Help yourself. <laughs> I'm not doing it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, well, the, uh, the 104 is an interesting airplane in that if you think about it, I'm not sure it became a movie star with the right stuff, with that mm -hmm. whole thing with Jaeger, with the NF-104. Yeah. And I don't know that the airplane... Maybe a lot of kids play with it as a model, but it, it didn't reach that. I got another great aviation product going there. The fun of being on an airport. But it didn't really kind of where it is now. Everybody, you know, our aircraft is uh, actually a Fokker, mm -hmm. you know, built yeah. under a license. Yeah. But it didn't reach that kind of iconic status, I think. Well, it, see, Kelly Johnson went to Korea. And this was uh, when the MiG-15 showed up in Korea. Uh, this was a big surprise to the Air Force. And the MiG-15 was actually a better performing airplane than the F-86, which is our best airplane. It could climb higher and uh, had, you know, at least 5,000 foot altitude advantage. And uh, so it, and it was a tough airplane, you know, and it well armed, had 37 millimeter you know, cannon and so forth. And uh, so when Kelly went to Korea and he interviewed the pilots, says, what kind of an airplane would you like to have, you know, in light of your experience? And they all said, we want something that can climb like hell and get up to a high altitude. There we go again. We got a, a busy day going on today. If I got to do an edit point there anyway. Oh, okay. Can I bring that a little bit closer? All right. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. And uh, so Kelly went home then, and he designed the F-104, and it basically, it was a designed to be an interceptor. It was a point interceptor. It was, they were worried about the Russians sending bombers over the North Pole and so forth. So he wanted an airplane that could take off, climb to altitude, chase down bombers, shoot them down, and so forth. So it was never intended to be a dogfighter. And uh, it, it was the, really the first airplane that held all four of the, the world speed records. You know, so it had uh, it two speed records and two altitude records. Uh, the, they had the low altitude record, you know, you know, less than 300 feet above the ground. Right. Uh, the high altitude record, it was the first production airplane to go faster than Mach 2. Uh, then it had the time to climb, and it also had the peak altitude. And so it was the first airplane that held all four of those records. And so it, it was, it did what they wanted it to do, but it didn't have, you know, the capability of being a real fighter bomber or, uh, you know, an interceptor and, and do dogfighting and so forth. So the Air Force really wasn't interested in it that much, but. Uh, other countries were, like Germany and uh, the NATO countries, 
they wanted to have an airplane because they're small countries and you have the capability of being able to take off, climb up to 50,000 feet, chase down any airplane. You know, they're, they, all the bombers in those days were subsonic, so you could overtake them at uh, essentially a thousand miles an hour and uh, shoot them down. And so there was a, I think they sold all together about 5,000 of them, and many of them were built in Europe. Yeah. And uh, so the, the airplane had a very successful life in that kind of a uh, situation. And I believe the Italians were the ones that, they were the last ones to have them in operational use up until the 2000 or so. so. I, I knew somebody, there we go again. You know, we got a busy day on the airport today. Um, I knew somebody who, who I've talked to somebody who flew against the Italians, you know, and the aggressor stuff, and they hated flying against the 104 because the one the Italians would just point that they'd point the nose right at you, and you couldn't see the couldn't airplane. See it. It was so small. And yeah. the only thing that they what they learned was obviously they were smokers. Yeah. And if you could pick up the smoke, then you could find the airplane. But the the Italians would always put the, the nose right on you, you know, mm -hmm. what they call knife fighting, right? Yep. And, yep. and they would, uh, they were very, very difficult to see. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I was amazed uh, when the when our airplane came in and we restored it. I mean, it's built like a tank. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously yep. with those types of yep. forces. So you moved on. Where'd you go from the F-104? Well, then let's see what... Uh I think the Navy, the navies, uh, they were wanting to fly or come out with a new uh, carrier-based anti-submarine warfare airplane. And so they transferred me over onto that project, and that's what became the S-3A right. Viking. And so I was responsible for the design of the flight control system on the S-3A. And so I was on that program until... 1972, I think it was, and uh, well, there was a there was a little intermediate area there when the uh, SR-71 uh, was just starting to fly in the early 60s, like 62, 63. Uh, they were having trouble with the inlet control system, and so they asked me to go over there and see if there's anything I could do. They'd already spent a caboodle of money to try to fix the inlet control system and it was working sort of you know but it really wasn't doing what they wanted it to and they so we're talking about inlet control we're talking about airflow into the engine in, into the end of the turbine yeah. right yeah. and some people don't realize but all these airplanes have baffles and all kinds of things they, for an airplane that's only flies up to about say Mach 1.5 you can get by with a fixed inlet but any airplane that's going to go above Mach 2, you better have a variable inlet because you lose what's called pressure recovery. So whenever you have an airplane like an airliner, uh, you're recovering about 99.9% .9 of the uh, dynamic pressure as it comes into the inlet, and then that slows the air down, goes into the compressor. So you get a sort of a free compression right. uh, for, before it goes into the uh you know, engine. Well, on these uh, supersonic airplanes, as you go faster than sound, you get a shock wave that stands out in front of the inlet, and you start losing that so-called pressure recovery. And so if you go fast enough, why well, you lose so much pressure recovery that you're not getting any useful thrust out of it. So they have to go with variable geometry inside there to slow the air down you know, incrementally instead of an all-in-one big fell swoop because the air has to be going subsonic when it goes into the engine phase. And even the F-4, it's got a variable geometry inlet inside there. You that, can see the baffles yeah, in it. Yeah, right, they're yeah. very clearly, right. they're yeah. very clear now in there. The, the SR, it, because it cruises at Mach 3.2, they have a very, very elaborate, uh, you know, variable geometry inlet. And it has to be done automatically because there's just too much for a pilot to take care of. And uh, so they have a, a spike control that, monitor, you know, that uh, 
scheduled as a function of mark number. You have bypass doors, so you know, there's a bunch of bunch of stuff in there. Right. And uh, so anyway, I, I gave them some suggestions, but uh, they had already spent so much money on it. They decided they couldn't didn't have the money to go in what I considered a proper fix. And uh, so they kept uh, fiddling with it and refining it and everything. And over several years time, they finally got it. So it was working well enough. And that's when I first met Ben Rich, you know, and the okay. Skunk Works. And then uh, after I got through, here we go again. Greg, we may have to shoot down that Stearman pilot, I think. Anyway, so you met I, Ben. Yeah, and then after I got through, that was at, after that point is when I went on the SRA program. And then after I got through with the SRA program, well then Ben was starting work on Half Blue. Which this is the first stealth airplane that we were going to build. He remembered me and he asked me to come over and, then, and help him with the design of the control system on Half Blue which I did, and then after we got through the Have Blue, and on the 117. So, it, uh, and then that was the. Let's go back on the uh, inlets for a second, because I want to. The uh, that would cause a compressor stall uh, if you get uh, essentially low pressure within the. Yeah, the again getting back to the SR 71, if you just you have what's called <clears throat> a normal shock wave. Then the pressure, it's the air is coming in at Mach 3.2, and you pressure is on the back side is a l up a little bit, but the Mach number is very, very low, and you have lost a lot of pressure. So the, you, at the engine face, you might only have like 30% of the pressure. So theoretically, if you did the job perfectly at Mach 3.2, you could get 90% of the pressure really? recovery and that's what all this variable geometry basically uh, almost like coke bottling or yeah. telescoping yeah. the air so you have first oblique shocks yeah and so you have the when the hits is the cowl and so you design the uh, oblique shock just to be right on the lip of the inlet at cruise so the air that's coming in then you've captured just the right amount of air that's going to go into the engine so then it goes into the engines or into the uh, inlet. It's still going supersonic, and so it slows down a little bit more with some more oblique shocks inside. Right. And then it uh, gets into the final normal shock, and so that's at a Mach number of about 1.4. And now you go into what's called the diffuser section, and now the pressure starts building up. And so when the SR-71 is cruising at 80,000 feet, the pressure inside the inlet at the engine face is 18 PSI. So it's higher at 80,000 feet inside the inlet than it is at sea level. Right. You know, on steel static. So uh, the inlet makes sure that you get that high pressure air into the engine face and it's going subsonic. And that's the way that the engine is continuing is able to run and get the thrust did you have any uh, and we're down in the weeds here but that's what this program is we do an hour and <laughs> there are people at home that have just lapsed into a coma because you and i are talking <laughs> about stuff they don't understand there's other people going oh that's really cool i was interested in this but the um, uh you, did the aircraft you can have that same problem on angle of attack right where uh, you're starving the you could, yeah, the, but the SR-71 was not a maneuverable aircraft. I mean, it was designed to do, it was a point cruise airplane. Uh, it just barely, you know, you 30 degree bank angles, that right. sort of thing and everything. So it was not a maneuvering airplane. But some if, of these fighters. Yeah, like now, if the, you had uh, a fighter like the F-4 or an F-15, uh, the F-15 in particular has got a, uh, a lip, you know, the upper edge of the inlet. So at high angles of attack, the, it actually bends down that way. So when the airplane is flying at a high angle of attack, the inlet uh, actually goes down, and so the air is coming in to the inlet uh, that way. So there, there's lots and lots of different ways 
of uh, you know generating a variable geometry inlet depending on what the mission is. Probably the most notable one that I can think of is the F-14, the A, yeah. the the A model F-14, which right. in carrier operations, yeah. which the Navy knew yeah. full well, they lost a lot of pilots. Yep. It had angle of attack any, problems. Any airplane that was designed to cruise at or above Mach 2 uh, really needs to have the variable geometry inlet. Uh, the F-104 could cruise at Mach 2 and it could go actually a little bit faster than that, but the pressure recovery starts dropping off. It did not have a variable geometry inlet. So you meet, uh, you meet Ben Rich, who really is going to pick up from Kelly Johnson and go on right. in, in context right. of the company. And now you're, you're uh, at Tonopah or wherever, and you're seeing uh, Have Blue here. Well, what I, was your impression of that? Well, I, I started on it in uh, March of uh, 1975, and uh, I can tell you the whole story going all the way back, but uh, Dick Cantrell, who was the chief of aerodynamics, uh, he had been working on it already for about three, four months at that time. And uh, do you want me to go back to Dennis O'Brien? Wherever you want to go oh, okay. with this. This right. is your interview. Have fun with it. Okay. Well, I was going to go over that yeah. this evening, but as long as we're doing it here and you've got, you got plenty of film. So. Uh, in early 60s, there was a Soviet theoretical physicist by the name of Peter Utemsev, and he uh, wrote a book about what he called the physical theory of diffraction. And what it was, was a, uh, he had a, for the first time a description of how electromagnetic waves operated and interacted with uh, different shapes, different materials, and so forth. And so this course is right in the middle of the Cold War, and the uh, uh, Soviet censors, and uh, they, they looked it over, and yeah, this ivory tower stuff, you know, that's not... You know, not a big deal, and so go ahead and publish it. So he he was able to publish his book, uh, you know, in the open literature, and uh, there was a uh, somebody in the U.S. Air Force was all his assignment was to keep his eyes open for all of the any interesting material like that, and he didn't know if it was worthwhile or not, but he had it translated from the Russian, and that's why how. Dennis Overholzer, who worked at the Skunk Works, happened to get a copy. Uh, Dennis worked in the scientific computing section, and his boss was Bill Schroeder. Bill Schroeder was a mathematician, and he had just retired. And when, after Dennis read Utemsif's book, he could all of a sudden understand that this was a way that you could predict the radar cross-section of anything if you used it theory. So he talked Bill Schroeder into coming out of retirement, come back to Lockheed, and inside of a three or four months, they had put together a computer program that took Utemsev's theory, and they called the program Echo One. And for the first time in the, the Skunk Works history, uh, there was a actual method where you could design for a specific radar cross-section. And uh, so that was a, a really big important thing because previously, the SR-71, there was a significant conscious effort to try to reduce its radar cross-section. And the way they did it then was they actually took the real airplane took the engines out, took the landing gear out, every, all the heavy stuff, mounted it up on a pole, and then they would look at it with a radar. And if they saw any place that was sending back a strong reflection, then they had guys like Ed Lovick, and Ed was a radar guy, and he would go look at it, and then he would try to figure out what kind of a, a change they should make to the, ra you know, the radar-absorbing material and they would do that, put it back in again, and so forth. So it was a cut and try operation. And they, they did this, you know, for quite a while until they got it as good as they could get. And 
the uh, SR-71 had the lowest radar cross-section of any piloted airplane <clears> until <throat> Hav Blue came along. Uh, so that was a very important uh, thing there that uh, when Dennis found that book by uh, the Tempso. And so then they decided, well, we, we should design an airplane that has even much lower radar cross-section than the SR. So they started, they just built some simple little shapes, tested it in the analytic chamber, and it, it looked sort of just like squashed pyramid. And it, it wasn't a flyable airplane, didn't have any wings or whatever, but it matched the predictions of the Echo 1 program. And that's where, I think it was Ed Baldwin, one of our old designers, and he called it the hopeless diamond. The hopeless <laughs> diamond. So anyway, uh, now, that's when Dick Cantrell got involved and he said, how can we use this Echo One program to design a flyable airplane? So he, they gradually morphed the design into an airplane with wings, tails and a canopy to put so the pilot could see and where to put the engines and so forth. And that's where I came in then was now, because any aerodynamicist that looking at that shape knew that it was going to be unstable. You know, there's a, they had a 72 degree leading edge sweep. That meant that by the time you packed all the stuff inside that shape, the CG was going to be way far aft. And when you have a very far aft CG, it's going to be pitching up and so right. forth. So, so they knew that it was going to take a, quite a bit of help, you know, stability augmentation system. And uh, so they called me in, and it just so happened by pure happenstance that the Air Force had just started the F-16 into series production. So it was just now starting to get out into the squadrons. And the thing about the F-16 was is that it had a fly-by-wire flight control system. I won't we'll go into all the good details there, but the, the idea of fly-by-wire systems had been around for 50 years, but the technology just didn't exist. I mean, you know, they were, it was an electronic box. The pilot, he moves the controls in the cockpit, that sends a command to the box. The box moves the controls around on the airplane, and he makes the airplane do what the pilot has commanded. So it's as simple as that. You know, he, when you move the stick, the computer says, oh, the pilot wants to do this or that or the other. And so it makes the airplane do that. And so that, that's got some really wonderful advantages to it. So like in a conventional airplane, if you have an AFCG airplane, then it's, it can get really, really touchy, on the, you know, like an F4 with an AFCG or, or the, any of them. And if you have a really far forward CG, then it's a real slug and it's hard mm -hmm. to fly. So with the computer running the business, it doesn't care about that. You know, so the pilot says, I want to pull four Gs and the, move the controls, get to four Gs as quick as you can. And then we're there. And it doesn't care if it's at half CG or forward CG. It just doesn't have to move the surfaces as far. In the, F, in the FC. Well, he can't, he, or he or she can't over control the airplane. That's right. Uh, yeah, the, that's the other advantage. Just basically takes the, the. You can build in limiters. You know, like any one of these airplanes that you've got out here, if the airplane, the pilot goes above corner speed, he can yank the stick back and the wings will come right off. Well, when the F 16, with its fly by wire system, they put limiters in there so he could yank and wank all over the place and they would not you know, it would limit the g's he could pull as hard as he wanted to it would take it right up to nine g's and they hold it there and the uh, as long as he had the thrust up of course right <clears throat> and so the fact that there was an f-16 production line going and their computers going then it seemed obvious that what we needed to do for Have Blue was to use the F-16 computer in Have Blue because we were going to have to have angle of attack limiters, we're going to have to have side slip limiters, rate limiters, all of that, and we wanted to be able to do it quick. You know, so if we were to design a control system like what's in the F-4 there, 
it would have taken us 18 to 24 months longer. But using the fly-by-wire technology that had been developed for the F-16, put that into our Have Blue airplane, we were able to fly the airplane within about 20 months from the time we got to go in. Really? So you just program, yeah. Yeah. You programmed so, in the parameters into the box, right. and then you go out and see yeah. it and, and it was it was easy to change. So when and you invariably find problems that you need to fix, you know, and such like with the box, you just change a few cards and overnight, literally, and you could put the thing. That was, you're going somewhere I was going to ask you, is that all firmware? Is it, it all chip based or it, was there, the, you know, the first now, F- we're used to hard drives and all the other stuff. Yeah. The first F-16 uh, uh, flight control computer was an analog computer. It was not a digital computer. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, the F-18 was just starting at that, about that time. And they were the first ones to have a digital flight control system. It was going to be fly-by-wire also. And so our customer said, uh, if you're going to use the digital machine, then we want you to have something like 25% margin on throughput, and we want you to have 100% margin on storage and on and memory, that kind of thing. Right. And in those days, uh, the computers uh, that the F-18 was using did not have the throughput that we needed. And so, it, because our airplane was so much more unstable and so forth, so it needed to have a, a very large throughput compared to what the F-18 was. And so the uh, F-16 computer, being an analog computer, we used large-scale integrated circuit chips and we could change those chips very quickly. And so that we didn't have to write new software and we didn't have to go through all the big V and V process and so forth. So we could make changes quickly. And that's what really made us be able to whip through the program successfully and very quickly. It would seem to me too that the, the system would be, for lack of a better term, harder. In other words, less prone to failure if it's chip based or uh, no i wouldn't say that i mean they were uh, the f-16 analog computer was quad redundant and uh, so it, the really big advantage was this was all qualified now so it had been qualified for vibration and shock and arizona road dust and all the yeah. you know, emp all that yeah. stuff you know, we couldn't use any of the F-16 cards except for power supplies. So the, the chassis, the power supplies, we could use them as is. But we had to uh, design new control laws to go into the computer. So Lear Siegler, who was the company that built the computer for the F-16, they were only about 25 miles from the Skunk Works. So we could, very easy for us to coordinate. Oh, wow, yeah. And uh, so we could uh, come up with our designs and they would mechanize it using the same technology but in a different you know internal configuration and so we were able to get our uh, first box in we put it in an iron bird did all the normal kinds of testing that you would do with any computer box and then uh, go ahead and put it in the airplane and, and it was very successful were the have blues they're gone we yeah, they yeah. lost both of them were they designed to be run to failure aircraft uh, and you expected they, to lose them or they were technology demonstrators uh, the echo one program would tell you what shape you needed and uh, we built uh, quite a few different models uh, pole models and looked at them with radar and we could show that the uh, radar measured on the models was much smaller than any other airplane had ever even come close. You know, we were hundreds of times smaller. And there were a lot of skeptics. He says, yeah, you can build a, a model that you stick on a pole, but can you make a real airplane? Can you put a canopy in it? You, know, you got to have inlets to get the air to the engine. You got to have exhaust nozzles. Right. You have to have the gear doors and so on and so forth. So. Have Blue was the smallest, cheapest, little single pilot airplane that we could build that would demonstrate all of these technologies. So we designed the shape of it with Echo One. We put in two uh, non-afterburning J85 engines into it, 
we used all kinds of stuff that was whatever is available. And went down to the Amarg in, in Tucson, picked out stuff. That's and, amazing. Yeah. So you actually went to the boneyard yeah, and pulled yeah. out a bunch of stuff? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can tell you a story about that, too. But anyway, um, we put the airplane together quickly. And the uh, first half blue had its first flight on December the 1st, 1977. So it was a very, very quick program. And uh, you know, we used the first airplane to do all the structural type stuff, the demos, uh, the flutter, you know, all of the, you know, the engine compatibility, no, make sure there's no compressor stalls and everything. And then on the second airplane, it was when we had all of the RAM, you know, the radar absorbing material and all the other fancy stuff on it. And the second airplane then was used and was flown against all the ground radars that we could find and against F-15s, F-14s, all the airborne radar. Fire control radar. Yep, yep. And uh, so at the end of that uh, program, this that was in about uh, spring of 79, 1979, we had convinced the skeptics that you could really build a real airplane. Uh, the Havlu was uh, we it 0.8 Mach. And it could fly for about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Uh, we only took it up 25,000 feet, but uh, we did roll and pull three Gs and did all the kinds of maneuvers that the, an airplane should be able to do. And the Air Force then, they of course, they'd been following this very closely. And they said, Look, you know, we need to get going on this really fast. If if it was this easy for us, somebody else might be doing it too. Yeah. And so right away they wanted us to design a militarily useful airplane, and that's what turned into the F-117. So we used the same approach using Echo One, but well, Echo One was the first one, and they, you know, it was continuously improved and refined and getting more information and so forth and uh, so and but we again used the same f-16 uh, computer uh, in the uh, f-117 and uh, it had its first flight then on uh, june 18th i think of uh, 1981 so the we started flying uh, started the design <coughs> in the fall of 1979 and uh, so a little over two years later, it was just about two years, we were flying the first prototype. That's amazing. Yeah. And then after that, um, the Air Force was very, very anxious to get this into service. And so they started setting up squadrons. Uh, and the airplane, you know, they, they, were, they were most interested, of course, in radar signature. They wanted low infrared signature. They wanted to have low acoustic signature and also visual signature. You know, like you said about the 104 with the smoke trail and everything. Oh, yeah. They didn't want to have anything like that. So uh, they didn't have any airplanes yet for their pilots to fly. But the, we did not have an afterburner on the F-117. And so they... Uh, got they were using A7s as a surrogate airplane. Which we're working on back yeah. there right now, an A7A. So yeah. the A7 has about the same performance as uh, it's a subsonic airplane, just like the F117. And so the pilots could fly the A7s, get an idea of what kind of performance it has, and so forth. And uh, so while we were uh, doing the initial testing of the prototypes and getting it ready and also by the way developing the weapon system the weapon system was with the forward looking infrared and the downward looking infrared and so this was all going on at the same time that we were doing the radar cross-section type work and so forth and uh, uh, the first uh, the let's see what introduction of capability i think was in october of 1983 so we gave the air the air force had five or six airplanes at that time and it was considered to be uh, qualified for straight and level bombing at that point 
and uh, they could now start flying the real airplane. And that's when the uh, Air Force guys, we had, we had Air Force guys working with us in the test community while we were doing the prototype work. They did a lot of the flying for us. And the Lockheed test pilots did all the things like structural you know, demonstrations and flutter testing and so forth. And the uh, Air Force guys, tactical air command pilots, helped us with the development of the weapon system, you know, and things like that. Wait, was this an airplane, you know, you, you see in the test phase, and I, again, I don't want to get off into the weeds where you can't talk to me about it, but you see a lot of these types, I mean, they put them through pretty robust testing. They depart them, they do all that kind of stuff. Did this airplane go through all of that yes, as well? Yes, yeah. We, uh, uh, we knew, let me go back a little bit. Uh, we knew that the airplane was uh, very unstable and it was going to suffer pitch ups and pitch downs and yaw departures and everything. So we actually built a, uh, what we call a dynamically scaled models. And we, normally what you would do with any new airplane is you'd go back to Langley in Virginia and they have what they call a spin tunnel. And it's a wind tunnel that's got a vertical test section. And you want one you know, with a normal airplane like the F-4 or whatever, you'd stand up on about the third story and you'd throw your model out into this vertically arising air and you could see if it would spin and you could try uh, anti-spin control, blah, blah, blah. Well, we couldn't do anything like that because of the, the shape of the airplane and they didn't want, you know, the security would not allow anything like that. So we built these uh, models. They're about 30, somewhat, 36 inches long. And they're dynamically scaled so that their response, their dynamic response would be the same as the full-sized airplane at much higher altitude. And we had a hangar in Burbank there that had like five stories. And we went up into the fifth story and we built uh, what amounted to a slingshot. And one of the guys had a uh, crank that he would use to pull his boat in and out of the water. Right. And then we went down to the drugstore and bought two or 300 feet of uh, surgical tubing. And we made this giant slingshot. So we'd cock it with the guys hangar or his boat winch put the model on there and then fire it off and so we could fire it off at different speeds different angles of attack different whatever right and a uh, uh, hey this guy likes you man he keeps yeah. going by anyways and so what we found out was number one it was good news we couldn't make it spin but everything that it, whenever it departed it would always wind up in a hung stall you know i mean it would go pitch up like this it would lose a lot of forward speed and then it would go this way right lose a lot more forward speed and maybe about one more and now by this time it was going straight down and the angle of attack was about you know 70 degrees or so and it would just do descend perfectly campy all the way to the ground and there was nothing whatever that the pilot could do. We thought maybe that you know, it has a drag chute for landing. We thought perhaps if we were lucky, the guy could pull the drag chute and maybe that would help to right. uh, recover from that kind of condition. But we found out that if he didn't do it just exactly at the right point, right, uh, it would just flutter down on top of the airplane and get tangled up in the fins and wouldn't It'd do any over. good at all. That's game over. Uh, we, we could put if we put it on 100 foot risers, you know, and had a mortar here to deploy it. So if we could fire the whole thing out, you know, at the end of the 100 foot uh, risers and have the parachute open, then then it, it could recover. But yeah, that, that was not a, a viable solution. Comes to mind the um, in the Century Series fighters, probably the early F 100. The so early F 100. You know where you could get it at down low with the saber dance it was just yeah, completely yeah. unrecoverable right there was no way yeah and that was a deployed airplane which yeah. is right pretty serious well anyway um so what we had to do was to demonstrate 
through the control system that the pilot could whack around on the stick and do anything he wanted to in the cockpit, and he would not be able to depart the airplane. And so that was what we then very carefully, uh, we started out on our angle of attack limiters. We knew where the thing was supposed to depart at about 20 degrees angle of attack. So we started out with our setting our angle of attack limiter at about 10 or 11 degrees. And then we would have the pilots go out and, and slowly pull the stick back. And if that worked okay, then do it faster and then faster and faster. And we would try to do stick pumps and we would try to do this. And so if that all worked good at 11 degrees, then we'd change the box and raise it up another degree, and go through the whole routine again. And we kept on going up until we got to the point where the Air Force was satisfied that we now had a militarily useful airplane, could do all the mission that they wanted to and that the pilots uh, could ham hand it around, do whatever they wanted to, and it would not depart. And uh, tonight in my talk, I plan to read some of the, after we finish all of this, uh, we asked the TAC pilots and, and to, uh, the people that weren't involved with the testing, to fly the airplane and do anything they wanted to with it and see what they thought. And so I, I have a, a selection of different ones. What? So you had to be pretty excited when the airplane kind of combat deployed. It was Panama was yeah first, and everything worked right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. How, how was that? What was that feeling around the shop? Well, that was you know we were all very very pleased you know that the thing worked you know I mean the uh, it was one of the the most satisfying programs that I ever worked on is that everybody in the Air Force and Lockheed, you know, we were a team and we'd do anything that we had to to make the thing uh, work properly. And the, we certainly did not want, you know, I personally did not want to have my system be the thing that held them up or, you know, caused problems and so forth. So I'd say the airplane was engineered much better um, than in a lot of other airplanes, uh, simply because of that esprit de corps that we had, you know, with the in the the uh, Air Force guys were very helpful. You know, I mean, the engineers back at Wright Patterson, if we needed, you know, documentation or anything like that, they just bent over backwards getting it for us. You know, and so oh. the uh, it was it was really a splendid program to work on. So fast forward to the Gulf War. Yeah. Now yeah. the airplane becomes a movie star, right? Yeah. I mean, now right. Schwarzkopf's in there, mm -hmm. luckiest guy in Baghdad, yeah. that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Right. How was the feeling around the shop at that well, point? Well, that was, uh, everybody was very happy. And, uh, of course, we, we were still not allowed to say that we had worked on it. You know, I mean, it, it, uh, at that point, the only uh, people that were allowed to say they worked on it was Ben Rich. <laughs> and... Uh, it wasn't until about 1994, 95, somewhere along in there, that we we could actually say that we worked on the program. And so, uh, uh, my wife, she said, "Was that what you were working on all this time? You know, that's so sure is a funny looking airplane. You know, <laughs> what um, did you ever get any sense?" I think you and I have talked about this. The Russians, right? The Iraqi air defense was about as classic Warsaw Pact. And they were no, you know, looking back at it, they were no slouches. I mean, the Iraqis were armed to the teeth. They fought the Iranians. Yep. They, they were combat. They, they understood combat. They, I think they had Russian advisors in Iraq, mm -hmm. even at that time yes. with their air defense systems. Any indication that did they get completely caught flat footed on it, or you know, I mean, anything you can yeah, talk well, about? So, so far as I know, they did, but you know, the Air Force was they didn't come back and give us any you know privileged account or anything like that, and so we only knew what we saw on CNN, also. And but obviously, the pilots that were over there in uh, Saudi Arabia, 
they were so confident that they they could do it. You know, I mean, the first, the very first night, they were still a little bit antsy. You know, they, uh, the engineers say this stuff works. But we're going to go up there and we're going to really find out. And when they found out that it really did work the way everybody said it was, then they were just really pleased and happy with it. You know, they, uh, they, uh, I heard that uh, the guys in, in uh, Saudi Arabia were watching CNN and they knew that the tower that broadcast the CNN signal there in, in Baghdad was going to be one of the targets. And they knew from planning at what time the the bomb was supposed to drop on that tower. And they used their watches, three, two, one, now. And the signal went away. And they, okay. <laughs> That's pretty wild. You're watching TV and, and you yeah. know that this is going to yeah. happen. Well, it had to have been, I mean, you know, just from a third party perspective, you look at how long it took everybody to kind of catch up so yeah. to speak well in, at this you know here we are in 2021 and so the technology that's in the f-117 is 50 years old now but they're still flying them the uh, uh it's they have been retired you know because a lot of them are getting close to the lifetime on the fatigue life and so forth People don't understand that with military airplanes. Yeah. So yeah. People say, well, why, like our aircraft is retired? Well, it was a very high time airplane. Yep. yep. Second highest mission airplane. Right. And probably it hit all those thresholds to where the manufacturer says, okay, the airplane's going to, and this is for you at home, it's reached its fatigue life. Yep. Now mm-hmm. something's going to fall off or crack or yep. whatever, and we're going to stand it down. Yeah. That's generally why these airplanes end up in sure. museums, is and what you're talking about. Exactly. And uh, the there's some of the later airplanes still have some usable life in them, and uh, they uh, it, it has still very low radar cross-section. It has very low infrared, and it has low acoustics and so forth. And so our best airplanes now are like the... Uh, F-22 and the uh, F-14, F, you know, it's, uh, not at the F-14, F-15, they have these new uh, yeah, they electronically extended. scanned yeah. radars, and they are using the 117 as a surrogate target because they know, we know very well what its radar cross-section is, and they can now test these newest radars in the F-15 and the uh, F-22 and so forth against a known low signature airplane right? and develop tactics for it. And then also the F-35 now has got a, you know, a what's called an integrated infrared search and track system on it. So it's almost like a radar except that it's passive. So it can look around, see something hot, and then they can zoom in on it and figure out what it is. So they are testing uh, the IRST on the F-35s that are now being tested against the F-117. I was lucky, or I, I am lucky, periodically to talk to people, and I did talk to a Russian about it one time, and I uh, who would know something about it. And I said, so F-117, and he said, well... He said, we gave up trying to find it, and we started just what you, we started looking for the hole in the sky. Because <laughs> if yep. there's a spot where nothing's emitting, we kind of thought, well, that's where it is. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of intuitive. They had to completely turn their entire air defense on its head. Yeah. Uh, and the cost of that had to have been, well, and for their client states, in the Cold War, we had all these client states, and they would sell mm-hmm. them hardware and yeah. Not so much anymore. They're still buying arms from these guys. But um, imagine all that stuff is useless. Yeah. You the, know, it, the, there's a thing that's called the bi-static radar. And it's you have one or more, actually it takes two or more radar. And if you have a F-117 flying through the area, Theoretically, what you can do is, as it goes through the area, you can subtract out all the normal stuff that's in there 
And it, it's sort of like in the Star Wars movies, you know, where yeah. the, there's a, a quiver in the force. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what That's it, a good it, analogy. It's yeah. a quiver in the force. Yeah. And so, uh, but it takes tons and tons of computer power because now you have to be able to synchronize two or more radars. And then you have to be able to sort out all of the, the normal background clutter yeah and sort it out now like i say theoretically uh that should be able to find a any kind of a stealth airplane uh but whether or not that it would you know if there's enough computer power in the world to do that or not in the time that's required yeah it's real time you got yeah, airplanes it's got to be moving. real time that's potentially lethal right that's kind of scary yeah so uh, where do you think we're going to wrap up here in a minute but where are we headed with man? There's a lot of debate, and we do this thing called Warbird Wednesday. Greg and I went out and did this just as a lark, and we've done about 50 of them now. But we've moved through drones. We just did the Predator, uh, and you know you have the Reaper and all this other thing. Where's man flight headed? Just in your opinion, or, I mean, do we? Is there gonna? You know, I talked about in that segment we did that anything involving nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction there probably going to want to keep a man in the loop mm-hmm. as a fail safe if nothing else what do you think about where we're headed with man flight well it's it's long been recognized that uh, the human pilot is is the limiting factor uh, the f-16 was the first airplane that the uh, jet airplane that the air force had that could go to nine g's and it is very, very hard, you know, you have uh, for pilots whacking around there and going up to nine Gs, and they, they can have what's called G-induced loss of consciousness, and the pilot just blacks out. And so uh, they had lost quite a few airplanes and pilots in the, because of that. And now uh, they've developed uh, things that are automatically recover the airplane if the pilot's not doing anything you know, to help them. And so that, that, that'll, that helps a little bit. But I think in the long run, eventually, that uh, there's a, there'd be a human pilot involved, be sort of like a, an admiral of the fleet, and he controls a whole fleet of drones. So you might have a, one airplane like an F-35, and he controls maybe 10 or 15 drones and these 10 or 15 drones can then be you know they can be kamikazes if you want to do right or whatever and uh, so i think eventually that's the way it's going to go that uh, because missiles missiles already can pull 30 or 40 g's and they have much greater speed than any airplane can can do so uh, the no pilot is ever going to be able to outrun one or outmaneuver a, a missile. So you just the best thing to do is to keep them out of harm's way and let you the drones do it. Talk about tra- uh, uh, missiles and uh, and the speeds. Um, and this is going to be my last question, but I'm in, I'm at, I'm enjoying this. I think, as I said, we put everyone to sleep uh, when they see this at home. But uh, transonic, you're talking about transonic missiles and, and high speed. Uh, scramjet technology what can you talk about propulsion and control systems on those things or it's a very do they introduce what do they introduce it, it's a very very difficult problem uh, just simply because of the temperature you know, the if you remember the x-15 right it was the first airplane that could fly uh, up at around Mach 5 you know or it, it was rocket powered and it could only fly there for 30 seconds or so you know, after it ran out of uh, rocket uh, fuel. And they, that was made out of the best metals that we had. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Inconel X, you know, it, it, these things were the most exotic alloys. And they would melt, you know. And uh, so we have got a, a real difficult problem as far as materials are concerned. Uh, if you could, you're, you're going to have to go to something like ceramics, you know, uh, ceramic matrix type stuff where you have uh, carbon uh, fiber 
mm -hmm. and to give it strength, but it's protected on, you know, by uh, ceramic material from the high temperatures. Kind of like space shuttle type stuff? Yeah. And, okay. you know, the, the space shuttle, you know, it, of course, it's when it makes a reentry, it's going much faster than Mach 5 or right. Mach 6. But they had to practically rebuild all of the tiles on it, you know, every time because they even that the very best stuff that they could find would just get, you know, melted Burned and blown up. away. Yeah. yeah. So it, I, I'm not going to say it can't ever happen, but it, it's going to be a very, very tough problem to solve. I think that the scramjets you know, that that's coming along, it's probably doable. But uh, the basic materials uh, in the airframe, uh, that, that's going to be a real hard problem. To... Well, you think, you know, you just, every time we think we've hit a wall, right, somebody comes up with something that yeah. changes it. But uh, just uh, with the laws of physics and everything else, eventually there are the rules of nature you can't get past. And this friction thing, I think, mm -hmm. is yeah. going to be interesting how they, how they solve it. We won't know about it till 50 years on, right? Yeah, <laughs> It'll be maybe. like the F-117. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Bob, I sure appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you are going to be speaking tonight at one of our F-117 presentations. For those of you at home, uh, if you're watching this, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Like us on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. Remember, uh, there'll be a little donate bar down there. We cannot do this without your donations and do these restorations. I want to thank you. My name is uh, Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.